Welcome back. In the last three tutorials, we talk about the uh, the difference between solid, liquid, and gas. We talk about the London dispersion force. We talk about dipole-dipole interaction, and now we would like to look at the last one of the intermolecular force, which is called the hydrogen bonding. Now, before we look into the term hydrogen bonding and the detail about hydrogen bonding, let's look at some facts. Okay, and let's think about why is there a difference. Okay, here is uh, presenting here is the different boiling points of uh, different chemicals. We have hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen chloride, and oxygen gas. Now, in the last tutorial, we talked about the difference between hydrogen chloride and O2. And the difference between these two uh, boiling points is, uh, is due to the different attractions. Okay. Uh, London dispersion force being a very very weak attraction is instantaneous only ha only occur when it only occurs when two molecules approach to each other and what we see here in hydrogen chloride is that they have the, because of the pol polar nature of the molecule the partial negative end of the chlorine would attract with the partial uh, positive end of the hydrogen. So this kind of positive negative attraction makes them to get closer together and it takes more energy to break them apart. And this is the reason why hydrogen chloride has a much higher boiling point compared to O2. Now let's look at hydrogen fluoride. If you look at this boiling point it is a lot higher. Okay, We are not talking about negative numbers anymore. We are talking about positive 19.5 degrees Celsius. So what we can tell based on these three numbers here is that while O2, the, the, the attraction between the oxygen molecules are very weak. So that's why we have a very low boiling point. And now we can see progressively higher, okay, hydrogen chloride, it has a higher boiling point because the attraction is stronger. And now when we look at the hydrogen fluoride, the boiling point is even higher. So what that means is that the attraction between the hydrogen fluoride molecules is going to be very very strong. But why and what makes the attraction particularly strong? Now if you think about the London dispersion force, we talk about how we can use the molar mass, how we can use the number of protons and electrons to, to think about the strength of the attraction. But if you look at the uh, if you look at the molar mass here, okay, let's compare hydrogen fluoride and O2. Well, O2 has approximately 32 grams per mole for the molar mass. Okay, not too heavy, not too light. But if you look at hydrogen fluoride, the molar mass is around 20 grams per mole. It is lighter than O2 molecule. So when the molar mass is smaller, when the number of protons and electrons are less. Why? Why is the boiling point even higher? That doesn't make sense. So something must be going on between the hydrogen fluoride molecules and that thing, that interaction is make is explain it well that that difference will explain the the attraction would explain the difference in boiling point. Okay, so now let's take a look here, okay, and uh uh, in these three hydrogen fluoride molecules. Now, it looks very similar to what we saw in the last tutorial, okay, on the hydrogen chloride. So, and it is indeed very similar, okay. Well, we, it is uh, the the covalent bond here. It's polar. They are not sharing electrons equally. But there is one thing. There is one thing that makes the fluorine very different than chlorine. Okay, and uh, if you remember what you learned previously in the chemistry, fluorine is the is the most electronegative element in the entire periodic table. Okay, and it has the value of 4.0. Okay, now how would this extreme high electronegativity make a difference? Okay, well, let's think about this. The, the electrons right here they're shared, right? Just like the uh, hydrogen chloride. But they are even. Uh, they are shared even. Well, unfair. Well, the this sharing it's even unfair. Okay, so um, you can imagine these two electrons being very, very, very close to fluorine, and 
what we see here now, the symbol is the same, partially negative, but I want you to imagine that this partially negative is even greater, okay? It's even more negative than what we saw in hydrogen chloride. Now, what's going to happen, okay? Now, something I want you to think about, to, to consider, is that how many protons do, uh, how many protons does uh, hydrogen have, okay? Well, if you look at the periodic table, hydrogen has one proton, okay? Atomic number one. And it has one electron, which is being shared with fluorine. So what's going on here is that the hydrogen has a proton right here, okay? The electron is being shared with the fluorine. So the question now is that, well, if the electron's right here, what is on this side of the hydrogen? Okay, let's think about this. If there's one proton right here, the electron in the 1s orbital is being shared with the fluorine. So what's going on on the, uh, on the hydrogen end of the molecule? Well, there's nothing except this proton. And this is the reason why, why the hydrogen becomes so susceptible to attraction, because it is so exposed to the outside environment. So what will happen is that the very negative, okay, very partial negative of a fluorine will attract with the very positive hydrogen, okay? We will see it here, we will see it here, okay? So this even more extreme polarity is what drives the boiling point to be so different compared to the other two molecules. Okay, so now this kind of attraction it's called hydrogen bonding. Okay, now be very clear that this hydrogen bonding it occurs between molecules. Okay, because a lot of students we, uh, a lot of students got confused with the term hydrogen bonding. When they look at the term hydrogen bonding, they look at the term hydrogen, they look at the word bonding separately, and they would think that this is the hydrogen bonding, which is not. This is just a covalent bond. It's a polar covalent bond between between hydrogen and fluorine. This is not hydrogen bonding. Because when we talk about intermolecular force, inter means between molecules, uh, intermolecular means between molecules. Well, this is the attraction between the molecules. So this is hydrogen bonding. Now, here's the question. When do we see hydrogen bonding? Okay, do we just see it here or do we see it somewhere else? Well, there are two requirements. There are two requirements for hydrogen bonding. First, the, fir the first requirement is that within a molecule, the hydrogen must be covalently bonded to either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Okay, that's the first requirement. Now, you may ask, why these three elements? Well, we knew about fluorine. Okay, fluorine is very electronegative, and so is oxygen and nitrogen. They're very small and they're very electronegative. So when hydrogen is bonded with these three, one of these three elements, it makes the proton of the hydrogen very easily exposed to the outside environment, being susceptible to attraction. Okay, so that's the first requirement. Hydrogen being bonded, covalently bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Now the second requirement is that the hydrogen will be attracted to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine that each uh, that one of these three elements is also covalently bonded to hydrogen. Why? Because only with hydrogen that they can grab the electrons more, okay, because hydrogen is quite weak in terms of electronegativity, and therefore the, uh, the negative charge on those three elements will be slightly stronger, okay? So they, are, they will be more negative than what we saw in dipole-dipole interaction. So these are the two requirements for us to see hydrogen bonding. Now, let's think about this. What do we have? So when we asked the question earlier in the first, uh, first video in this series, we talk about why water 
it's liquid. Okay, well, let's think about, let's draw them out. Okay, let's draw the water molecule out. I'm going to erase all these right here to spare us some room. Okay, and let's draw the water molecule. And if you remember from the uh, Vespa model and the Lewis dot structure, water is in bent shape. Okay, and there are two lone pair electrons on the oxygen. Okay, so now, so what we do with these uh, oxygen molecules? So first is the understanding of the polar covalent bond. These bonds right here, they are co they're covalent bonds and they are polar because the oxygen is very electronegative. They're, the oxygen the oxygen atoms are going to grab the electrons away from the hydrogen. So we can draw these arrows to show the dipole. And we are going to annotate the hydrogen and oxygen with the, with the partial positive and partial negative symbols. Partial positive right here, partial negative, partial positive, partial positive, and so on. Okay? Alright, so now, what's going to happen next? So here, the water molecule fulfills the first requirement, which is the hydrogen is being bonded to uh, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. In this case, it will be the oxygen. Now, the second requirement is that the hydrogen will be attracted to either nitrogen, ox oxygen, or fluorine that is also covalently bonded to hydrogen. So we will expect to see attractions right here. Okay, so now, this is the reason why, now we can draw more water molecules and we can, we can repeat this structure infinitely, but I want you to see this attraction right here. The strong attraction between the hydrogen and oxygen is what accounts for the physical state of H2O at room temperature. It's liquid. Okay, the molar mass of H2O is only 18 grams per mole, much less than O2. But the boiling point of water, okay, it's 100 degrees Celsius, way higher than O2. Why is that? It is because of the hydrogen bonding that we see here. Now, let me give you one more question to think about here. If you put ice into water, does ice float or sink? Take a moment to think about this, okay? Does ice float or sink, okay? Now, if you have experience with drinking soda or drinking ice water, you should we you, you you can recall the image that ice floats on water. If you don't, then let's think about what we see in the Arctic. Okay, we have ice sheets on top of the ocean. Okay, and that insulates the water, so ice floats on water. Now we have to ask ourselves another question, which is why? Why would ice float on water? Why would an ice sink? Because from what we see a lot of from what we see in other chemicals, when they form solid, it's more dense and they should sink. But why is an ice sinking in water? Well, let me show you an outer water molecule to explain why. Now what I'm going to draw here is an outer water molecule. Okay. And what's going to happen is that there is attraction with the hydrogen and there's an uh, between the hydrogen and oxygen. Now, what you are seeing here is this hexagon. Now, this hexagon is it's one of the amazing structures that we, was, that we see in water. And this is something that we have to appreciate because without this hexagon, we could all be dead because we would not have ice to reflect all the solar radiation. We would not have water existing on Earth. Okay? So what's going on with this hexagon? Why is, why is this so amazing? Well, let's think about this. What is trapped in this hexagon, okay? So, what is there? What is inside this hexagon? Well, did we draw anything in there, in the hexagon? Nope, you didn't draw anything. 
So in this hexagon, there's nothing in there. And this is the this is the reason why when water freezes, it expands because when the water molecules form these hexagons, it takes up more room due to the void space in between the water molecules. Pretty amazing, right? Okay. So so this is the reason why ice floats because of the expanded volume compared to liquid water. Okay. And it has a lot of implication that we see on Earth. If you look into environmental science, if you look at to the climate change, okay, or climate in general, the the way that ice behaves has a lot to do with the hydrogen bonding. And this is just one of the most amazing things that I would say I would appreciate about nature. This is the hydrogen bonding. Okay. Now, where do we hear hydrogen bonding? Okay. Now, let me give you two examples. Okay. If you took biology already. You should learn that the double helix DNA, and the reason why DNA is in this double helix uh, shape is because of the hydrogen bonding within the DNA that hold them together and twist them. Okay, that's the first thing that we talk, that we learn about hydrogen bonding. Now, my second example is more real life related. It's one more you related. Okay, now we heard about, we use shampoo, right? We use shampoo and conditioner. For, uh, to clean out here, okay. How does this relate to uh, hydrogen bonding? Well, it has a lot to do with hydrogen bonding. Did you realize that when you put on some, when you use conditioner after you use shampoo, your hair is a lot more smoother? Well, there's a reason, okay. Your hair is smooth because the there's some hydrogen ion that goes to your hair and that repairs the hair, so it feels a lot more. Uh, it feels more smooth. When you put conditioner on, okay, after you use the shampoo, if you just use the shampoo, what happens is that the, while shampoo is basic, it takes away the hydrogen from your hair, and that's why your hair feels dry after you use the shampoo, and therefore you are recommended to use shampoo and then conditioner, okay, both and not in reverse order. Okay, you use shampoo first because the base. Would help remove the dirt, the grease, the oil from your hair, and then the conditioner would repair your hair and make your hair look smooth and silky. Okay, so a lot of science that we can learn and uh, that we can refer to hydrogen bonding. And I want you, I hope that you can appreciate uh, the fact that hydrogen bonding has a lot to has a lot to do in our daily life. So. With all these, okay, so we have went, we went through all these all three intermolecular interactions, okay, intermolecular force. We have London dispersion force that we see predominantly in nonpolar molecules, okay, but it also it is also uh, found in a polar molecules, but it's just a lot weaker, okay. Uh, when we have regular polar molecules, we have the dipole-dipole interaction. And if the molecules is composed of hydrogen and nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, then we will see hydrogen bonding, which is the strongest intermolecular force among those three. Okay.